Mary and Joseph arrived at the temple and found Jesus just as he was finishing his last explanation. All the scholars rose in complete amazement and looked at each other, exclaiming, What a prodigy of a boy! Joseph humbly remained silent while Mary approached her son and said with reverence and affection before all those present, Son, why hast thou done so to us? Behold, thy father and I have been seeking thee sorrowing. In a very serious tone of voice, Jesus replied, How is it that you sought me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Mary and Joseph did not understand what he said, first because just then they were overwhelmed with joy at finding him, and secondly because they had not heard him explaining the Messiah's mission. Moreover, during all this time, the soul of her son had again been veiled from Mary's eyes. For a moment it seemed as if several of the scholars who were so angry at Jesus might do him some harm. But then the Holy Family quietly went out through the crowd, which opened to let them pass. Soon they had left the city. When they were alone on the road, Mary knelt before her son and asked his blessing. With loving tenderness, the boy Jesus raised her from the ground, comforted her, and revealed to her all that he had done in those three days. Later during the journey, he also explained to her that the learned doctors had not recognized him as the Messiah because they were inflated and arrogant in their own knowledge and that their understanding was obscured by the darkness of their pride. For if they had had the humble and loving desire to see the truth, his reasoning would have sufficiently convinced them. And his mother kept all these things carefully in her heart. Our Lady said to Venerable Mother Mary of Agreta, The Lord absented himself from me in order that by seeking him in sorrow and tears I might find him again in joy and with abundant fruits for my soul. In my great love, the uncertainty as to the cause of his withdrawal gave me no rest until I found him. In this I wish that thou imitate me, whether thou lose him through thy own fault or by the disposition of his will. For to lose sight of God for the purpose of being tried in virtue and love is not the same as to lose sight of him in punishment for sins committed. So strong are the bonds of his love that no one can burst them except thy own free will. Chapter 22 The Hidden Life in Nazareth When the boy Jesus returned to Nazareth with Mary and Joseph after the finding in the temple, a party was given in his honor by 33 of his young friends and relatives, who later became his disciples. The banquet table was decorated with wreaths made of ears of corn and vine foliage, and in front of each child were bunches of grapes and bread rolls. During the meal, young Jesus told his companions a beautiful story about a wedding at which water would be changed into wine and indifferent guests into faithful friends, and then about another kind of wedding at which wine would be changed into blood and bread into flesh as a living bond of love until the end of the world. At the time, the boys did not understand what he meant. He also told his young cousin Nathaniel that one day he would attend his wedding. Henceforth, Jesus was the acknowledged leader of these boys, and he spent much time with them, sitting and talking with them or accompanying them on walks in the country, and all the time teaching them many practical lessons. As Jesus grew up, he helped St. Joseph more and more at his carpentry work, and when he reached the age of 18, he became his foster father's regular assistant, thus giving St. Joseph great pleasure and consolation. Jesus' bed was a plain wooden couch that Joseph had made for him, and he used only one blanket and a small woolen pillow made by Mary. Yet he would not even stretch out on this hard bed, but rested sitting on it. And when his mother spoke of getting him a better bed, Jesus replied that the only couch on which he was to be stretched out would be his cross. 
Each evening, Mary would kneel before her son and ask his pardon for not having done all her duty in serving him and for not having been sufficiently grateful for the blessings of the day. And each morning, she likewise asked him to order her to do what he wished during the day in his service. Jesus now began to show more gravity in his conduct and conversation with his parents. More and more they observed a certain divine power and majesty in his features, and they caressed him less. Yet in his relations with them, he remained humble and obedient and loving. However, as the time for his public ministry slowly approached, he became more recollected and devoted more time to prayer and meditation. Every day, Jesus, his mother, and Joseph prayed together in Mary's plain and poorly furnished room, the holy room in which the Annunciation had taken place. They prayed aloud, standing with their arms crossed on their chests in the light of a lamp, and frequently Mary and Joseph prayed silently together. Sometimes they knelt, and sometimes each lay face down on the floor with arms extended like a cross. Occasionally, when Jesus prayed for hard-hearted sinners, Mary saw drops of blood appear on his face, which she would then wipe away with deep reverence and compassion. At other times, she perceived him resplendent with glory, as during the transfiguration, and surrounded by adoring and chanting angels. Young Jesus continued to visit the poor and the sick in Nazareth and the neighboring villages, and while influencing for the good everyone whom he met, he secretly helped many persons, both spiritually and physically. Throughout these years of his hidden life, Jesus spent much time teaching his mother all that she must know and do later for his church. Soon after the return from Jerusalem, when he was twelve, the Eternal Father said to Mary, we have resolved to make you the closest image and likeness of my only begotten Son. Be mindful, therefore, that a great preparation is required of you. Henceforth, Jesus instructed his mother thoroughly in the new law of his gospel and all the mysteries and doctrines of the Catholic religion. Day after day he taught her the meaning and value of the sacraments and dogmas of the church, and he described to her the whole history of his church until the end of the world, together with all its saints and martyrs and doctors and prelates. He also showed her how to apply this knowledge in a practical way to her daily life, so that she might be well prepared to serve him and his mystical body the church, as divine providence planned. Mary received these inspiring instructions with profound humility, reverence, gratitude, and fervent love, which reached a climax when Jesus explained to her the mysteries of the Holy Eucharist and the Mass. Then she exclaimed, My Lord and life of my soul, shall I be so fortunate as to bear thee once more within my body and soul? And Jesus answered, My beloved mother, you shall receive me many times in the Blessed Sacrament. And after my death and ascension, it will be your consolation, for I shall choose your sincere and loving heart as my most pleasing and delightful resting place. From that hour, Mary humbly and gratefully began to prepare herself in all her thoughts and actions for the time when she could receive Holy Communion. And she prayed fervently that all men might know and appreciate this greatest of all the sacraments. By a special privilege granted to the Blessed Virgin by God, after she reached the age of 33, during the hidden life in Nazareth, Jesus being then 18, her beautiful physical appearance and perfection remained unchanged during all the rest of her long life. She now strikingly resembled in features and complexion the unique beauty of Christ during his last years on earth. And the Lord allowed Mary to keep that perfection in order that his likeness might be preserved in her as long as she lived. Speaking of the Hidden Life the Blessed Virgin told St. Bridget of Sweden, As the Gospel says, 
My son was subject to his parents, and he acted like other children until he grew up. Nothing unclean ever touched him, nor was the least disorder ever seen in his hair. When he grew older, he was constantly in prayer. His features and his words were so wonderful and so pleasing that many persons, when in trouble, used to say, "Let us go to Mary's son. He will console us." As he grew in age, he worked with his hands, and he talked with us so inspiringly about God that we were continually filled with indescribable joy. And when we were in fear, in poverty, and in trouble, he did not produce gold and silver for us. But urged us to be patient, and we were marvelously protected. What we needed was sometimes given to us by compassionate and devout persons, and sometimes came from our work, so that we had what we needed to live on. But nothing superfluous, for we sought only to serve God. At home, with friends who visited us. He talked familiarly about the law of God and its meanings and types. He also openly disputed with learned men, so that they were astonished and used to say, "Joseph's son instructs the scribes. There is a great spirit in him." He was also so obedient that when Joseph said to him, "Do this," or "Do that," he did it at once. For he concealed the power of his divinity in such a way that it could only be perceived by myself and at times by Joseph. Very often we saw him surrounded by a wonderful light and heard angels' voices singing over him. We also observed that unclean spirits, which could not be cast out by official exorcists, fled at the sight of my son's presence. Keep this always in your memory, my daughter, and offer sincere thanks to God that He chose to reveal His childhood to others through you. Chapter twenty-three: The Death of Saint Joseph. At this time, although he was not very old, Saint Joseph was worn out in strength and health after twenty years of hard work for his family. And the Lord now ordained that he was to spend his last eight years of life in illness and suffering, in order to increase his sanctity through the practice of patience and resignation. Mary therefore lovingly persuaded him to give up his work, which Jesus had been helping him to perform, often miraculously making it easier for him. Now Mary gladly volunteered to support the family as she had done in Egypt. By spinning and weaving linen and wool with the help of a good and loyal woman friend, consequently she often spent the greater part of the night at work. Although Jesus sometimes enabled her to accomplish a great deal in a short time, during his last years, Saint Joseph suffered a series of fevers, violent headaches, and a very painful rheumatism, which made him weak and helpless. As Mary observed how he bore all his sufferings with humble patience and supernatural love, her affection and admiration for him increased every day, and she joyfully labored for his support and comfort. His greatest consolation was that she should prepare and serve his meals herself, and she often made special efforts to get him choice foods. She would often take off his shoes for him and support him with her arms. And console him with kind and inspiring words. During his last three years, Joseph's illness grew worse, and Mary nursed him day and night. Several times she begged the Lord to let her take over her husband's suffering, and when his pains were keenest, she obtained her son's permission to command them to cease for a while. She also ordered her angels to console Saint Joseph, which they did by appearing to him in beautiful human forms, and speaking to him about God, or by singing heavenly hymns for him. All this time, Jesus also helped and encouraged his beloved foster father, whenever he was not engaged in his intensive preparation for his public ministry. 
Realizing one day that the hour of St. Joseph's death was very near, Mary went to her son and said to him, My Lord, I beseech thee, let thy servant Joseph's death be as precious in thy sight as the uprightness of his life has been pleasing to thee. And Jesus replied, My mother, your request is granted, for the merits of Joseph are great. I will now assist him and will assign him so high a place among my people that he will be the admiration of angels and of men. With no other human being shall I do as with your husband. Then, for nine days, St. Joseph enjoyed the company of Mary or Jesus without interruption. And three times each day, the angels comforted him with celestial music and invigorating fragrances. On the eighth day, he fell into an ecstasy that lasted twenty-four hours, during which he was shown clearly many divine mysteries which he had believed by faith concerning the Incarnation and the Redemption, and he was formally commissioned as the messenger of the Savior to the patriarchs and prophets in limbo. When St. Joseph came out of this ecstasy, his face was shining with heavenly light, and he asked Mary to give him her blessing. But instead, she indicated that Jesus should bless him, which he did. Then Mary fell on her knees and begged her dying husband to bless her. And after he had done so, she kissed his hand tenderly and affectionately. St. Joseph also implored her pardon for all his deficiencies in serving her and requested her prayers in this hour of his death. Then he spoke these last words to her. Blessed art thou among all women, Mary. May angels and men praise thee, and may the name of the Lord be known, adored, and exalted in thee through all the coming ages. I hope to see thee in our heavenly home. And turning toward Jesus with profound reverence, St. Joseph tried in vain to kneel. But the Savior gently took him in his arms, while Joseph said, My Lord and my God, Give thy blessing to thy servant, and pardon the faults I have committed in thy service. I give thee my heartfelt thanks for having chosen me to be the husband of thy mother. May thy glory be my thanksgiving for all eternity. Jesus then lovingly blessed St. Joseph and said, My father, rest in peace and in the grace of my eternal father and bring to the saints in limbo the joyful news of the approach of their redemption. At these words, in the arms of Jesus, with Mary kneeling and weeping at his feet, in a room brightly lighted by hosts of angels, St. Joseph died a happy and peaceful death. After Jesus had closed his foster father's eyes, Mary prepared his body for burial with the help of her angels. And as she did so, God enveloped it in a wonderful light so that she could see only Joseph's lifelike face. The body was wrapped in a white shroud and placed in a narrow bier, which was then carried to a fine tomb given to St. Joseph by a rich man. Only Jesus and a few friends formed the funeral procession together with a great number of resplendent angels. The Blessed Virgin said to Venerable Mother Mary of Agreda, The whole human race has much undervalued the privilege and prerogatives conceded to my blessed husband, Saint Joseph. I assure you that he is one of the greatly favored personages in the Divine Presence and he has immense power to stay the arms of divine vengeance. That which my husband asks of the Lord in heaven is granted upon earth, and on his intercession depend many extraordinary favors for men. Chapter 24 Preparation for the Public Life During the four years between the death of St. Joseph and the beginning of Christ's public ministry, 
The Blessed Virgin did not have to work so much and was able to spend more time in prayer. Jesus and Mary usually took only one meal a day at about six o'clock in the evening. Frequently they ate nothing but bread, although sometimes Mary added fish or fruit or vegetables. She served her divine son on her knees. Often in the privacy of their home, Mary would remain prostrate on the ground adoring her Lord until he told her to rise. And then with tears of reverence, love and humility, she would kiss his feet or hands. She did all the housework for him with joy and eager zeal, and whenever her angels would begin her tasks before she did, she would order them to stop so that she could do the work herself. At such times she would say to them, My friends, permit me to do this work, since I can thereby gain merits which you do not need. I know the value of such work which the world despises, and the Lord has given me this knowledge in order that I may perform it myself and not let it be done by others. At work or in prayer, she composed and sang lovely hymns in honor of her Lord. Once, when Mary was almost overcome at the thought of the future ingratitude of men toward their Savior, Jesus ordered the angels to console her by singing canticles of praise to God for her. Then Christ gave his mother a still deeper understanding of the mystery of sin and redemption, and he encouraged her by revealing to her the great number of the predestined apostles and saints of the church. As the time for his public ministry approached, Jesus and Mary prayed more and more fervently together for the apostles whom he was soon to call to his service. The Lord also showed his mother how he was going to conduct his preaching and how she was to cooperate with him and help him to found his church. Sometime after the death of St. Joseph, Jesus and Mary decided to move to an isolated cottage near Capernaum on the northern shore of the Lake of Galilee. When Jesus began to spend most of his time in prayer and traveling in preparation for his public ministry, some of the inhabitants of Nazareth criticized him. He therefore accepted this cottage by the lakeside when a man named Levi, who lived in Capernaum, offered it to him, for he would be able to meet there more conveniently with his future disciples. Jesus and Mary made several trips between Nazareth and Capernaum, transporting their modest belongings on a donkey. Finally, they thoroughly cleaned and then closed up their house in Nazareth, although later they stayed there whenever the Savior preached in Nazareth or its surroundings. After reaching his 27th year, Jesus began to mingle more with men and to go away on trips that lasted several days. Often he spent the nights in prayer on the hills of Galilee. During his absences, Mary missed him keenly. When he returned after two or three days without rest or food, he gave his mother his hand and greeted her with great affection, yet also with grave restraint. Then she lovingly prepared refreshing meals for him, and he told her about the hidden blessings which had been communicated to many souls. One day Jesus said to her, my dearest mother, the time has come when, in accordance with the will of my eternal Father, I must begin to prepare the hearts of certain persons to receive the light of my teaching. In this work, I want you to follow me and assist me. Henceforth, Mary accompanied him on many of the short trips which he took to the towns and villages of Galilee, Usually she humbly walked behind her son along the country paths, and she stood silently praying beside him during conversations with men and women, while he announced to them the imminent coming of the Messiah, assuring them that the promised one was already in the world and in the land of Israel. Thus he became acquainted with those whom he knew to be prepared and able to accept the truth. In his appearance, Jesus showed so much beauty, grace, peace, kindness, and gentleness of manner 
and his way of speaking was so vivid and strong that with the help of divine grace, many persons decided to give up their sinful ways of life and thus became capable of believing that the Messiah had already begun his reign. In addition, usually accompanied by Mary, Jesus visited the sick and the grief-stricken, especially among the poor. He restored health of body to many and assisted the dying, giving them true peace of mind. Mary did the same, particularly among the women. During this preparatory ministry, Jesus and his mother worked alone together, accompanied only by angels. Some of the nights they passed in prayer in the open. Often they begged for their food, and sometimes the angels brought it to them. Meanwhile in the desert, St. John, the son of Elizabeth and Zacharias, having reached the age of thirty, was commanded by the Lord to come forth and prepare the way for the Messiah as a forerunner. John the Baptist was intensely devoted to the Mother of God, for until he was nine years old, she had regularly sent him food by her angels. And since then she had often told them to give him news of his Lord, whom he fervently loved and worshipped from afar. Now St. John left the desert and appeared among the people of Israel, preaching penance and baptizing on the banks of the river Jordan. He was clothed in a camel skin with a leather belt. His feet were bare and his features thin and ascetical. Yet in manner he was graceful, modest and kind, though he could be terrifying to the proud, the hard-hearted and the greedy. One day, when Jesus was thirty years old, Mary heard a voice of marvelous power say to her, Mary, my daughter and my spouse, offer your son to me as a sacrifice. Realizing that the time had at last come for the redemption of mankind through the public life and death of Christ, she replied generously, Eternal King and Almighty God, Lord of all, He is thine and so am I. What then can I offer thee that is not more thine than mine? Yet because he is the life of my soul and the soul of my life, to yield him into the hands of his enemies at the cost of his life is a great sacrifice. However, let not my will, but thine be done. I offer up my son in order that he may pay the debt contracted by the children of Adam. The Blessed Trinity immediately rewarded and consoled her by a vision in which she was shown the glory and the good that would result from Jesus' sacrifice and hers. When she came out of this rapture, Mary was prepared to endure the pain of being separated from her beloved Son and Lord. Jesus therefore called her and said, My mother, give me your consent to accomplish the will of my eternal Father, for the time has come when I must begin my work for men. Although I must now leave you alone for a while, my blessing and powerful protection will remain with you. Later I will return and claim your help and company in my task. Both Jesus and Mary were so deeply moved in this moment of parting that they were weeping quietly, and the Lord tenderly placed his arms around his mother's shoulders. Among other things, he told her that he would still go to Jerusalem three times for the Passover, and that the third time her heart would suffer cruelly. Then Mary fell at his feet and said with intense sorrow and reverence, My Lord, I offer thee my own will as a sacrifice, and as thy mother I ask only that I may be allowed to share thy labors and thy cross. They went to the door together, and Mary kissed her son's feet as he gave her his blessing. Then Jesus set out on his journey to the river Jordan, where John was baptizing. During the absence of Christ, Mary spent nearly all her time in prayer, shut up in her house. 
Many times each day, in order to practice penance and reverence for God, she genuflected and prostrated herself on the floor, interceding for sinners by her prayers and mortifications. The rest of the time she conversed with her holy angels, whom the Lord had commanded to attend her in visible form. They kept her informed of all her son's actions and prayers, so that she was able to pray with him whenever he prayed, in the same posture and with the same words. Meanwhile, she continued to visit the sick and the poor in her neighborhood. In addition to the detailed reports of Jesus' doings, which she received from the angels, the Blessed Virgin was also able to witness in visions all the most important incidents of the public life of Christ, no matter where he was at the time. Thus, she saw him being baptized by John, and then go up into the mountainous desert and begin his forty days fast. Mary then locked the door of her house, and entering her little oratory, she began to pray and fast with her son, imitating and cooperating with him in his work for mankind. After forty days of uninterrupted prayer and fasting, she witnessed the threefold temptation of Christ by Satan, and from her retreat she likewise entered into conflict with the tempter. When she saw the devil carrying Jesus from place to place, she wept. But soon she rejoiced over the victory of the Lord. Then her angels brought her some of the heavenly food which they administered to Jesus at the same time, and with them came a number of birds that had kept him company during his fast, and they gathered around her and sang sweetly while she ate the miraculous food, which quickly restored her strength for Jesus had sent it to her with his blessing. The Savior now spent several months preaching and preparing some of the men and women who were to become his disciples. In order to imitate him, Mary left her solitude and devoted nearly all her time to visiting on foot some sick and poor women and children, instructing and healing and consoling them. When she saw Jesus called to his service his first apostles, Andrew, John, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel, Mary accepted them as her spiritual children in the Lord and prayed fervently for them. The Savior taught them to revere and admire his mother even before they met her, and he impressed upon them her extraordinary sanctity and virtue. At the very first words of the Master concerning Mary, St. John conceived a holy love and esteem for her. The five apostles begged Jesus to let them meet and honor his mother, and he therefore led them northward to the Lake of Galilee. As soon as Mary was aware that they were approaching, she set the cottage in order and prepared food for them. When Jesus came near, she waited for him at the door. And when he entered, she prostrated herself on the floor and kissed his feet while she asked for his blessing. The profound humility and reverence with which the Blessed Virgin received her son filled the disciples with new devotion and awe for their master. Feeling a mystical attraction toward the Holy Mother of God, they immediately knelt before her and begged her to accept them as her sons and servants. St. John was the first to do this, and Mary welcomed him with special love because of his extraordinary purity and humility. Then she personally served the meal which she had prepared for them. That night after the disciples had retired, Jesus prayed with his mother in her oratory, as formerly, and he spoke to her about the mystery of baptism. Because he had already promised her that she would be baptized, she now asked him whether he would administer the sacrament to her himself. Then, in the presence of a multitude of visible angels, Jesus baptized his Immaculate Mother, and immediately the voice of the Eternal Father was heard saying, This is my beloved daughter, in whom I take delight. Next, the Incarnate Word declared, this is my beloved mother, whom I have selected and who will assist me in all my works. And lastly, the Holy Spirit added, This is my spouse, 
chosen among thousands. The Blessed Virgin said to St. Bridget of Sweden, You are not able to see my son as he is in heaven, but let me describe to you his physical appearance as he was in the world. His features were so beautiful that no one looked at his face without feeling filled with joy and consolation, even when depressed. Yes, even the wicked were free from worldly gloom while looking at him. Consequently, persons suffering from sorrow used to say, Let us go and see Mary's son, and we shall be without our grief at least that long. When he was twenty years old, he reached his full growth in manly stature and strength. He had no superfluous flesh, his muscles were well developed, and he was powerfully built. His hair, eyebrows, and beard were light brown, his beard measured the width of a hand, his forehead was neither prominent nor retreating, but straight and erect. His nose was well proportioned, neither large nor small. His eyes were so clear and pure that even his enemies enjoyed looking at him. His lips were not thick, but light red. His chin did not jut out and was not over long, but pleasing and finely proportioned. His cheeks were moderately full, and his complexion was a clear white mixed with fresh red. He held himself straight and erect, and there was not a spot on his whole body. Chapter 25 The Wedding at Cana After his return to Galilee with his first disciples, Jesus and his mother were invited to Cana, near Nazareth, to attend the wedding of a young couple whom they knew. The bride came from Bethlehem and was related to St. Joseph's family. Her father, who now lived in Cana, was a wealthy man who had charge of the transportation of mail and owned a number of inns and warehouses with large stables. His wife was quite lame. The groom was a prosperous young man from Capernaum whose parents were dead and who was related to St. Anne. The Blessed Virgin urged Jesus to accept the invitation and he not only promised to attend the wedding, but also undertook to be responsible for some of the arrangements and for the supply of wine. Our Lord considered this wedding of great importance for several reasons. He wished to begin his public ministry by sanctifying and blessing the institution of marriage. He wanted to strengthen and to unite his new disciples by performing his first public miracle among them and he wished to refute the unjust criticism which had arisen against him during his prolonged absence from home to the effect that he was neglecting his work, his mother, and his relatives. The numerous guests who had been invited to the wedding traveled to Cana in several parties. The Blessed Virgin went the shortest way along the narrow paths across the hills, accompanied by some women friends for they preferred to avoid the caravan road in order to be alone. Jesus took a longer route with about 25 of his followers, as he wanted to stop and instruct them on the way, and also to speak to the people in certain villages. Thus Mary reached Cana first, after a walk of several hours, and she helped in the preparations for the wedding. When Jesus arrived, she went out to meet him with the bride and her parents, who greeted him with marked respect. The bridegroom's aunt invited Jesus and Mary to stay in her large house. Jesus himself planned all the details of the wedding festivities, deliberately combining serious considerations and spiritual instruction with the various entertainments. When he announced the program for the next few days, he explained that the guests were free to enjoy themselves in the traditional festive ways but that they should also grow in wisdom as a result of their recreation. On the second day after his arrival, all the guests, the men on one side and the women on the other, went out to a lovely meadow in which there were trees and a stream. Some of the guests walked up and down talking together, 
while others played various games. Jesus organized a game in which the men, sitting in a circle on the ground, tossed different fruits to one another according to certain rules. As he watched them play, his expression was one of friendly seriousness, and several times he said a few well-chosen words which made a deep impression on the men and aroused their admiration. Later he distributed the prizes to the winners with fitting individual comments. While the younger guests competed at running and catching fruits tied to the branches of the trees, in another part of the field, the women were playing a game with fruits as prizes, which the Blessed Virgin watched, sitting between the bride and the aunt of the groom. That evening, Jesus preached in the temple before all the guests, who now numbered over 100. He spoke of pleasures which are permissible, of the motives with which one might indulge in them, of their limitations, and of the caution and restraints that must accompany them. Then he spoke of marriage, of the mutual obligations of husband and wife, of continence and chastity, and also of spiritual marriage. When he was through and all the guests had left, the bride and groom remained with him, and he gave them some private instructions. Later in the evening, after a banquet, there was a dance. First, the young couple danced alone, and then some of the guests joined them in a series of calm, rhythmical movements by which they formed various figures. None of the future apostles took part, nor did the married women, but some of the disciples did. The whole atmosphere was one of quiet and restrained gaiety and good cheer. The wedding ceremony took place at nine o'clock the next morning. The bride was dressed and adorned by her maids and companions. Her costume was very similar to the one which Mary had worn on her wedding day. She also had a crown, but it was more richly decorated. In the solemn and colorful procession from the house of the bride to the temple, the young couple was accompanied by children carrying floral wreaths and playing musical instruments as well as by all their relatives and guests. The ceremony was performed by the priests at the entrance to the temple. The Blessed Virgin had already presented the two rings to Jesus for his blessing, and now she gave them to the bride and groom, who exchanged the rings. The chief priest, taking up a sharp instrument, lightly cut the pair's ring fingers and let flow into a cup filled with wine two drops of the groom's blood and one of the bride's. After the couple had drunk the wine, they destroyed the cup. After the ceremony, clothes and other objects were distributed to the many poor persons who had gathered to see the wedding. And when the newly married couple returned to the festival hall, Jesus himself welcomed them and said to them and to all the guests, The peace of the Lord and his light be with you. Before the banquet, Jesus organized another remarkable game for the men in the garden. He placed various flowers, plants, and fruits around a large table on which there was a pointer that rotated on a pivot until it stopped before the prize of the person who had twirled it. In this game, which the men now began to play, nothing occurred by mere chance. Each prize somehow had a definite significance related to the qualities and faults of its winner. And as each of the players in turn won his particular prize, Jesus made a brief and profound comment. Yet the personal application of his words was grasped only by the man to whom they were directed. The others found in them merely some broadly edifying teaching. But the individual himself was deeply moved and felt that Jesus had indeed seen into the most secret thoughts of his heart and conscience. When the bridegroom won a very striking exotic fruit, Jesus spoke about marriage, chastity, and the hundredfold fruit which purity produces. And as the master handed him his prize, the young man was stirred to the depths of his soul. 
he turned pale, and without anyone noticing it, he underwent a mystical purification in which he was supernaturally liberated from the unclean lusts of the flesh. At the same time, the bride, who was sitting among the women at some distance, had a fainting spell and experienced something similar, while the Blessed Virgin held her in her arms and helped her to revive. Thereafter, both the boy and the girl seemed definitely brighter and purer in appearance. The other disciples, after they had eaten the fruit which they won, felt their predominant passion awake and struggle for mastery within them. But when they used their willpower and resisted the impulse, they conquered it and thereby became greatly strengthened against future temptations. When the game was over, everyone went into the wedding feast in a spacious hall with three long, narrow tables at which the guests reclined, the women remaining apart from the men. Jesus had the seat of honor at the head of the middle table with the relatives of the married couple. The groom served his guests, assisted by the steward and several servants, while his wife and some maids served the women. When the bridegroom brought the carving knife to Jesus, the master reminded him that at the banquet when they were boys, after the finding in the temple, he had predicted that he would attend the youth's wedding. The young husband now became very thoughtful as he recalled what Jesus had said then, for he had completely forgotten this incident of his childhood. Jesus gave the guests an instructive talk while carving the lamb. He spoke of the lamb being separated from the flock and led to be killed. Then he explained how, in the process of roasting, the flesh was purified by fire. The carving up of the parts, he said, symbolized the way in which the followers of the Lamb of God must leave those to whom they are attached by bonds of flesh and blood. While distributing the pieces of meat to the guests, who were eagerly listening to his instructions, he said that just as the lamb had been taken from its companions and had been put to death in order to provide food for many persons, so too he who wished to follow the Lamb of God must leave his home and neighborhood and family and put his passions to death, for then he could become, through the Lamb of God, a source of spiritual food by which he could unite his fellow men with one another and with the Father of all in heaven. Throughout the banquet, as during the whole wedding celebration, Jesus was very cheerful while taking every opportunity to give the guests helpful instruction. He also spoke about relaxations and pleasure at social gatherings remarking that a bow must not remain bent all the time and that the soil must, from time to time, be refreshed by rain. During the festivities, the Blessed Virgin had spoken only when she was asked a question or when it was really necessary. At all times, she gave a good example to the women around her by remaining perfectly recollected and composed in her son's presence, she listened attentively to all that he said, and then she meditated on his words. During the banquet, Jesus and his mother ate some of the food, though with great moderation and without showing outwardly their unusual abstinence. Then, as the second course, consisting of bird meat, fish, honey, fruit and pastry, was being served, Mary noticed that there was no more wine. She therefore immediately went to Jesus, who was instructing the guests, and whispered to him, They have no wine. She also reminded him that he had promised to supply the wine. The Divine Savior, who had just been speaking of his Heavenly Father, replied aloud with calm and loving yet impersonal majesty, what is that to you and to me, woman? My hour has not yet come. Then Mary understood that Jesus was waiting for his eternal Father's permission to perform his first great public miracle. Feeling entirely relieved of her anxiety for the guests, 
and trusting that Almighty God would reveal the Lord's power at the right moment, she went to the worried servants and said to them with quiet modesty and confidence, Do whatever he tells you. Then, having done her part as intercessor for others, the Mother of God humbly returned to her place among the women. A moment later, Jesus told the waiters to bring the water jars to him and to turn them upside down. The servants brought in six large stone jars, which were so heavy when full that two men had to carry them. That they were now empty was evident when they were turned upside down. Then Jesus said to the waiters, Fill the jars with water. When the six jars, filled to the brim with water, were brought back from the well in a nearby cellar, Jesus arose, went to them, and blessed them. Then, returning to his seat at the table, he said to the servants, Draw out now, and take to the chief steward. The men did as he commanded. When the chief steward, who had been absent from the hall momentarily and did not know where they had obtained the wine, drank what St. John, an eyewitness, called the water after it had become wine, he went to the bridegroom and exclaimed in surprise, Every man first sets forth the good wine, and when they have drunk freely, then that which is poorer in quality, but you have kept the good wine until now. When the bridegroom and the bride's father tasted the miraculous wine, they too were amazed, for the servants were insisting that they had just filled the jars with nothing but water from the well. Then all the guests drank the new wine and fell silent from awe and reverence as they realized that they had indeed witnessed a striking miracle wrought by the Master, Jesus of Nazareth. Now the Savior gave them a long talk on the deeper significance of what had taken place. Among other things, he said that the world gives the strong wine first and then the poor, but it was not so in the kingdom of his Father. There pure water was changed into excellent wine to demonstrate that negligence and lukewarmness should give place to love and zeal. He mentioned the party in his honor when he was twelve years old, which many of his present listeners had attended as his childhood friends. He reminded them that he had spoken then of bread and wine and of a wedding at which the water of lukewarmness would be changed into the wine of love and enthusiasm. All those promises, he said, had now been fulfilled and he predicted that they would witness still greater miracles, that he would celebrate several Passovers with them, and at the last one he would change bread and wine into his flesh and blood, and thus he would remain with them until the end, to strengthen and to console them. And he added that after that last supper they would see things happen to him which they would not even believe if he revealed them now. All the men and women listening to Jesus were filled with awe and wonder. They were utterly changed in their attitude toward him as a result of the miracle which they had witnessed and also due to the extraordinary qualities of the miraculous wine. As St. John observed, Jesus had manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. His new followers and his relatives were now suddenly convinced of his power, his dignity, and his divine mission. Henceforth, they believed with firm faith that Jesus was indeed the promised Messiah. At the same time, they had become better men and women, more devout, and more united among themselves. Thus, by performing this miracle on the first occasion when his closest future apostles and disciples were gathered together, Jesus had succeeded in strengthening their faith in his leadership and their willingness to follow him. After the banquet, the young bridegroom went to Jesus and spoke to him very humbly in private. He said that he now felt himself dead to all carnal desires 
and that if his bride consented, he wished to live in continence with her. His wife then came to Jesus and said the same thing. The master took them both aside and spoke to them about marriage and chastity in terms of sowing and reaping supernatural merit. He explained the rich fruit of the life of the Spirit and mentioned the prophets and saints who had lived in continence and made of their bodies a pleasing sacrifice to the Father in heaven. Thus they had brought many sinners back to God and had inspired numerous followers who in turn formed holy spiritual families and communities. The young bride and groom now decided to take a vow of continence and they resolved to live as brother and sister for three years. Then they knelt before our Lord, and He gladly gave them His blessing. Chapter 26 Mary During the Public Ministry When Jesus and Mary returned to their home in Capernaum after the wedding at Cana, the Savior explained to His mother in a long talk one evening that His time had come and that he planned to leave for Judea and to celebrate the Pasch in Jerusalem. Then he would call his apostles to join him and would preach still more openly. Consequently, he predicted, he would be persecuted, and his enemies would stir up opposition to him in Judea and Galilee. Then Jesus described to Mary the principal events of his public ministry and explained how she and the other women were to cooperate in it. The Blessed Virgin wept at the thought of the great dangers to which her son would be exposed on account of the intense feeling which his recent teaching and miracles were arousing among his enemies, for she had been informed of all the rumors and slanders that were being circulated against him by persons who would not dare to utter them in his presence. That evening, the Savior also gave a talk in the synagogue of Capernaum, in which he explained the story of Elias and the rain cloud, in terms of the coming of the Messiah, bringing new life to all who accepted his teaching. He declared that whoever was thirsty could now drink, and whoever had prepared his field could now receive refreshing rain. He spoke so impressively that all his listeners and especially Mary and the holy women, were moved to tears. A few days later, Jesus traveled to Jerusalem with some of his first disciples. The women went there separately, and the Blessed Virgin stayed in the house of Mary Mark, the mother of one of the disciples. It was at this time that the Savior first drove the merchants from the temple. During these eight days, Jesus hardly saw his mother, for he was staying with Lazarus in Bethany outside the city. Mary did not go out, but spent her time praying for her son, as the evil intentions of his enemies alarmed her. In fact, after the Sabbath, the Pharisees decided to arrest Jesus, and they went to seize him in Mary Mark's home. But when they found only his mother and the holy women there, they rudely insulted them and ordered them to leave the town. Deeply troubled by this harsh treatment, the Blessed Virgin and the other women fled to the sisters of Lazarus in Bethany. Soon afterward they returned to Galilee. The Savior visited his mother briefly in Capernaum on his way northward to Tyre and Sidon. And during his absence Mary received visits from the holy women and some of the disciples who brought her news of her son. Several times she refused to see persons from Nazareth and Jerusalem whose only motive was curiosity. A very old servant woman was living with the Blessed Virgin, but she was so weak that Mary had to serve and take care of her. The house which they occupied was very much like its neighbors and quite roomy. They were hardly ever alone now that this home had become the master's headquarters. The mother of God did not own any land or cattle, and she was supported by the gifts of her friends. Besides the many hours that she spent in prayer, she worked at sewing, spinning, and knitting with small wooden needles. She did her own housework, and she often instructed and encouraged the other women. At this time, Mary was very youthful-looking,
tall and delicately built. Her forehead was very high, her nose rather long, and her eyes quite large and usually downcast. Her lips were a beautiful red, while her complexion seemed rather dark yet lovely. And there was a light natural rose tint in her cheeks. She far surpassed all the other women in her unique heavenly beauty, for although some of them may have had certain external features that were more striking, the Blessed Mother of God outshone them all because of her indescribable simplicity, modesty, sincerity, kindness, and gentleness. She was so entirely pure in soul and body that she reflected in a marvelous way the image of God in His creature. The only person whom she resembled at all in her bearing was her Divine Son. The expression of her features revealed her innocence, gravity, wisdom, peace, and holiness. Her whole appearance was one of true sanctity and nobility, and yet she also seemed like a simple child. She was always serious and very quiet, and often very pensive. Even when she wept, her grief did not spoil the loveliness of her features, for the tears just flowed softly down her calm face. When Jesus returned to Capernaum alone, having sent his disciples ahead, Lazarus came out to meet him and washed his feet in the vestibule of Mary's house. As the master entered the big central room, the men bowed low before him. He greeted them and went up to his mother, holding out his hand to her. She also bowed humbly and lovingly. Since he had begun his public ministry, she treated Jesus as a mother might treat a son who was a great prophet or ruler. She never embraced him in public now, but only extended her hand when he offered his. When they were alone, however, Jesus always embraced Mary upon arriving or leaving. But in the presence of others they treated each other with such restrained and holy affection that everyone who saw them was deeply touched. Next the Savior greeted the other women, who sank onto their knees before him, as he gave his blessing to all who were there. Then he calmed the fears of his disciples, who were greatly disturbed by the recent arrest of John the Baptist. The next day, when Jesus told his mother that he intended to go back to Judea, she wept. But he consoled her and assured her that he would accomplish his mission, for the sorrowful days had not yet come. Then he urged her to persevere in prayer for his work. Before leaving, he predicted to her and to his disciples that Mary Magdalene would soon be converted and would become a model of virtue. Meanwhile, he said, they should all pray for her and take a loving attitude toward her. During the three years of the Lord's public ministry, the Blessed Virgin accompanied him on many of his trips through the towns and villages of the Holy Land. And like him, she always traveled on foot, enduring all the fatigue and hardships involved in such journeys. Sometimes she became so exhausted that Jesus had to restore her strength miraculously. At other times, he obliged her to rest for several days in one of the inns which the holy women established for the Master and his apostles at strategic locations in Galilee and Judea. Mary always listened to her son's sermons with profound reverence, and by her rapt attention to his words, she inspired others to appreciate his teaching. When he spoke, she also prayed fervently that God's grace might enter into the minds and hearts of his listeners, for she felt an intense sorrow that the Redeemer of mankind should not be known and loved by all men.